Welcome back to Psychotherapy Expert Talks. Today we have something a little bit different. My good friend Hans Welling, who is a psychotherapist and writer here in Lisbon, Portugal, back in 2011, he made three interviews with three very important figures in the field of psychotherapy. I was struck by just how great these interviews are. I mean, Hans Welling did such a wonderful job in interviewing these therapists, helping them elaborate on their personal journey. So I'm re-uploading these interviews to this channel just so more people can have access to these great interviews. This video is Hans interviewing Jeremy Safran. The interview was conducted on October 2011. I hope you enjoy it. Okay. And Lucas just waiting in silence just a little bit to arrive. And... <sighs> So uh, maybe it's good to tell you a little bit about why and why of this interview. It's, it's um, I'm interested in creativity. I've been writing, done a little bit of writing on that, and I'm interested in how people get to new ideas, um, who inspires them, who teaches them, how people's life history kind of creates sometimes a unique situation for a certain discovery or um, and also how people work together to you know, to build this this like this human building we're making in like in the last hundred years I suppose which is kind of knowledge and science. So that's that's my interest. Apart from that, of course well, let me, I, I mean, I, I like that. Um, sure. So when you tell me about initially that sort of element of creativity sort of adds an extra element to it that I, li that I like. That makes uh -huh. it, yeah. Yeah. And of course, I'm a psychotherapist and I'm also very curious about the way you do psychotherapy. So there's like double, double interest. It's not only creativity, but it's also like how you do it and how you make it happen. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so... Um, I would like to start off with, um, I, I think I heard in the, in the APA video that it was a life before becoming a psychotherapist, that you first went to a Zen center and that you were reading already Sullivan before you started uh, becoming a, psych a psychologist. So my question is really like, what was there before? And, when did that decision happen? You know, when, when you were like, hey, I have to study this. This is my path yeah. or something. I mean, it, you know, it's difficult to remember precisely. I, I, I remember um, when I was in high school and I, you know, talked about my, my daughters with this. Um, I thought I was going to be a journalist. You know, I didn't really sort of think a lot about what it would mean to be a psychotherapist or anything of that sort. And um, so I didn't actually, you know, sort of decide I wanted to become a psychotherapist. Even when I was an undergraduate, <clears throat> I just took some sort of general liberal arts courses. Um, and it was really only after I dropped out of my after my first year, maybe it was the middle of my first year of university, I dropped out of school. I was out of school for a year or two. And then when I came back, that I decided I want to be a therapist. Although, to, to be frank, even in maybe the first year, I was sort of starting to think that. But I, I, I think the, the roots that go back further, um, I think when I was uh, sort of uh, younger, when I was 12 years old, my father died. And so that was, you know, just having to deal with that, I think, sort of uh, led to my developing a certain kind of, sort of precocious maturity, I suppose, you know, and sort of reading, you know, popular psychology things, I suppose. And um, without going into all the family dynamics, sure. I think... You know, as, as with many therapists, is the way in which I ended up being sort of the therapist to my family. Um, and then I think what happened was that a lot of my peers 
started, you know, sort of coming to me for advice. So I ended up sort of playing that role with my with my peers. So you know, there is something about you know having gone through that ex- traumatic experience plus whoever I was to begin with and so on that probably sort of predisposed me towards an interest in the psychological and then um, somewhere in university I started thinking I want to be a therapist and um, I didn't really sort of think much further than that as to you know what would be the route to be to be becoming a therapist, would I write, would I do research, it's just, I just had this idea that being a therapist was a good thing to do. And I actually remember uh, when I had dropped out of university, at one point um, I had this old Volkswagen van, it was in the uh, 60s, maybe early 70s, and I drove down with two friends to Mexico through the United States. And um, on the way, one of my friends, who'd been a friend of mine from high school, I hadn't seen him in a couple of years, he picked up this book by, you know, the psychiatrist R.D. Lang. And it, was not, it wasn't a book by him, it was a book about him. And I'd never heard of him before. And so I started reading the book. And there was something about Lang that really fascinated me. Um, and so I started reading R.D. Lang's book. And, and, and to be honest, I think that was a very important influence on me. Um, you know, the sorts of things that he was talking about, his interpersonal perspective, the idea that he's working with these schizophrenics and so on. So in terms of when you mentioned Sullivan, when I was an undergraduate, I, one of the first theorists that I started reading was Harry Spack Sullivan. And the way I got to him was somewhat complicated, but without going into all the details, mm-hmm. it had something to do with recognizing that Sullivan's thinking had, had an influence or in some ways um, was sort of anticipated some of the things that R.D. Lyne was talking about. There was something about looking at things from an interpersonal perspective, which was clearly there in Lang, which always fascinated me. So I started reading books by Sullivan and reading about Sullivan, and he really fascinated me as a character. And his ideas really fascinated me. Do you think that that book really thought, hey, maybe it's a nice idea to become a psychotherapist? Um, yeah, I mean, I think the idea of becoming a therapist started developing before then, but there was something about reading Lang and then Sullivan which really sort of consolidated my thinking, not so much about becoming a therapist, but about what interested me intellectually, I suppose. Yeah. Is the, is the really best way of putting it. Is. Right. Um, what, what, was, I mean, what was fascinating about this interpersonal? I mean, now you've thought about it 30 years, but at that moment, I mean, this is maybe a very difficult question, but at that moment, when you read that, like, in, what was like the seed or something that you saw, hey, this, this, this is it, or this is very good, or this is what I really like. It's a really good question. Uh, you know, th- there's just something about the sensibility that just sort of captured me as 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 being right. You know, about really sort of viewing everything from the perspective of an interpersonal feel. I had a very close friend as well as an undergraduate who became what a psychologist. Is sensibility? I mean, this, hmm? Can you elaborate a little bit more on what is sensibility in the sense of uh, Sullivan? Well. I think, I mean, there were two things that interested me. I mean, number one was this idea that he was communicating with these schizophrenic people who everybody had, you know, sort of thought could not be helped and that he felt that they actually were saying something meaningful and that one could communicate with them and work with them and help them. But number two, there is something about this idea that... um, you couldn't really understand what was going on unless you understood it in an interpersonal context. And there was something about that, I, I, I can't really explain why, but that's sort of a sensibility which has really run throughout my work, at the, mm-hmm. you know, if I think of it. So for example, later on I got involved in sort of focusing on 
uh, the therapeutic alliance and alliance ruptures and when communication breaks down essentially. And I, I, I suppose there is something about the fact that, you know, why was I so interested in what happens when communication breaks down? And I guess it must have been because I was sort of sensitive to that in some way as a, as a child. Like I just had some feeling that, you know, you'll be talking to somebody and everything is fine. And then all of a sudden it's like things start falling apart. You know, and so there's this kind of the way Sullivan spoke about it. He would say there's anxiety in the room. So it's like you somehow recognize that, and that made really a lot of sense to you. Is that's right? Down is suddenly be without contact, or it stops, or something. That's right. That's right. Okay. So it just that struck me as really important. So you know, I could elaborate at greater length, but I think that was the beginning of that particular sensibility. I think what is, we'll come back to that, because actually that's, that's an important issue uh, where I would where like to go, but I think what is special in your career is that you have uh, investigated so many different approaches to psychotherapy. It's not like most people who start off with one and then they fall off their belief and they go to another one, but you, you really went through a lot. You started off with CBT and then you worked with Greenberg for an emotion. And, and then you turn more into the interpersonal processes in the, in, the, in the cognitive therapy, the alliance ruptures. Then you turn to relational psychoanalysis. And finally, mindfulness in Buddhism. At least that's in your writing. Now I understand that that's much earlier. But I mean, there's really like all these interests. And, and now we're going to have this workshop, and suddenly attachment is there as a real issue. So um, my question is like, um, why do you think that, that that happened? I mean, that you're so... go to all these places. Is it like you're not satisfied with something? Or is it more, more like I'm curious and I want to drink it all in and want to understand it all? I think more the, the latter. It's, 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 you yeah. know, I never... Um, I, I've never been a true believer, you know, and I've never thought that one approach will give the answers. So I've just always followed things where my interests take me. And, and, and to be frank, I think all those different themes that you mentioned, most of them were probably there at the beginning at some level. It's not as if I went from um, cognitive therapy to interpersonal mm -hmm. theory to, you know, sort of mindfulness or whatever. It's um, the, cognitive, the fact that I became involved in cognitive therapy was somewhat of an accident of history. I you know, went to a graduate school that happened to be cognitive behavioral. It was not really a, an interest of mine, but you know, that sort of being in that environment led me to sort of, sort, of, sort of work within that environment and try to sort of frame my thinking within that in, environment. Mm -hmm. So that had an important influence on me. The interpersonal aspect of it was there long before then. There was an existential, built existential sensibility long before then. Mm -hmm. uh, the attachment aspect of it, um, I had studied John Bowlby as an undergraduate, I was kind of interested in him, I thought what he was saying was intriguing, and then subsequently I had some cousins who became very involved in uh, sort of doing research and attachment theory, and they sort of introduced me to, uh, reintroduced me to John Bowlby, mm -hmm. and so I started reading him more carefully. So, you know, it's like none of these things, it's not as if I went from one thing to another, it's more like a lot of these things were there and I was always interested in them. The, uh, you mentioned, um, you know, sort of emotional Les Greenberg. Now, that in some senses was an accident of, of history in the sense that um, I happened to be at the same university as Les Greenberg. He was, um, I was a new graduate student, he was a new faculty member, he was a faculty member in a different department. I was in a cognitive behavioral department. I sort of was finding as I was starting to try to do clinical work that these people didn't really, you know, it felt like they didn't have a lot of things, a lot of clinical wisdom really. Um, I took an elective seminar with Les Greenberg. I thought he seems to really know something about doing clinical work. We started talking uh, and things really clicked. That was a look. Yeah, so there was just a sense in which things really clicked between us. And we used mm -hmm. to have, um, you know, in terms of creativity, 
Um, I think that was probably one of the most, if not the most creative collaborations I've ever had, you know, is the way in which we used to just sort of spend hours talking with one another, mm -hmm. you know, and there's a sense in which we would sort of like build on one another's ideas, and it was very exciting. I actually, I had uh, another, uh, another friend who I used to do that with, but we never wrote together, mm -hmm. so I think it's, you know, it's, it, those kind of experiences are, are rare, creative collaborations. Um, so I think it was really because Les and I really sort of clicked and shared certain sensibilities, although we were very different in other ways, so that sort of led me in the direction of, um, I wasn't interested in gestalt therapy beforehand. Um, I sort of had some gestalt therapy training from Les. I subsequently got it from other people. Um, you know, and then all the work on emotions, etc., etc. It's not that I had a, an initial interest in emotions. It just sort of emerged out of my collaboration with Les and the fact that I was in this kind of cognitive behavioral sort of box at the time, you know, where emotions were not considered to be a primary phenomenon of interest, you know, that sort of, um, I think, gave, gave me and him some sort of, a, you know, sort of something to, to work with in some sense. Um, yeah. Okay, so I, maybe it's good to... You were talking about this collaboration and collaboration with other people. I mean, there are important works, you know, like I, I think that are really crucial works, like the, uh, the pro Interpersonal Processes and Cognitive Therapy book mm -hmm. that you wrote with Siegel, and then there's the other book, The Negotiating uh, Therapeutic Alliance, you wrote with Learn. So there's, it seems like you're always working with someone. Is that a correct assumption? Um. That's true for most of the books that I've written, but not for all of them. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, collaboration is important to me. There, there's, there's something about, um, and some collaborations have sort of fed me more, and you know, they all feed me in different ways. Um, some collaborations have sort of, um, yeah, to, to be honest, there's a way in which any collaboration I've been in, in one way or another, has been, has been, um, nourishing for me, but in, in, in different ways, you know, and sometimes it has to do with, you know, sort of being stimulated by the di by, by the fact that, you know, sort of, we build upon one another's ideas. In other cases, um, you know, with Zinzel Siegel, for example, it's like we were very close, uh, we worked together, we had lunch together every day, but we used to sort of, you know, sort of debate every day. We would always be sort of on opposite sides of the argument, and we used to love that, you know. Mm -hmm. So that used to be kind of exciting to both of us, you know. It was kind of fun. We used to laugh together hysterically. Um, with Chris Moran, it's the, the collaboration is a different collaboration. I think that's more one in which, you know, sort of gradually over time, we've sort of, like, built upon things together and we provide support of different kinds to one another. Each collaboration is different. Mm -hmm. The collaborations have been important to me. Yeah. I see. Going back to these all these different areas that you have studied uh, over the years, uh, there are so many therapists who like turn away from psychoanalysis. To me it seems that uh, you came back to psychoanalysis somehow, or ended up in say, psychoanalysis. Maybe that's a wrong assumption, but at least in the, the articles you publish in and, and, and the titles of your articles, it seems that you have really embraced psych, at least relational psychoanalysis lately. So that's, that's interesting, I and mean, maybe you could comment on that. I mean, like, oh, for so many people, it's like they turn their backs to psychoanalysis, and you're kind of finding it back, you know? Right, right. Well, <laughs> that's interesting. Um, you know, I sort of, um, when I was a, an undergraduate, I, I mean, I grew up in Canada where there wasn't much alive psychoanalysis, and the psychoanalysis I read and was exposed to in, in, the, um, in the 60s was... Um, um, was sort of, that was like in the heyday of American ego psychology and, you know, it had become a certain sort of orthodoxy and there was a certain kind of esoteric jargon to it and all sorts of trappings of psychoanalysis which subsequently have become the 
um, object, object of critique, such as the insularity and the elitism and so on and so forth. And so, you know, I, I was critical of that aspect of psychoanalysis and really didn't understand the language of psychoanalysis, wasn't influenced by it, there weren't any psychoanalysts. But for all that, I was very fascinated by the history of psychoanalysis. So I used to spend hours in the library reading about the sort of like early meetings between Freud and his followers and the Wednesday evening meetings. Now, so you on. make a video for APA, which is, if I'm, not, if I'm not wrong, called Psychoanalytic Therapy. So you really, you know, you advocate yourself as a psychoanalytic therapist, at least. Right. So, 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 so that part of it. Essentially what happened was, you know, psychoanalysis was never a perspective that I rejected. You know, obviously, you know, my interest in interpersonal theory and even some of my, you know, back in that era when I did my initial interpersonal work, I was influenced by the writing of Merton Gill, you know, who was sort of a well-known contemporary psychoanalyst at the time. So I was influenced by psychoanalytic thinking, but... It never occurred to me to uh, embrace sort of the psychoanalytic school. What, what, what happened in a nutshell is that um, <clears throat> I moved to New York from Canada. New York was a very psychoanalytic world. Um, all of a sudden, I was teaching in a university, which was very psychoanalytic. Um, all the audiences I spoke to were psychoanalytic, and all of a sudden, you know, it was just it was a different culture. On top of that, when uh, Jay Greenberg and Stephen Mitchell published their book in 1983, Object Relations and Psychoanalysis, I just happened to pick it up on the bookshelf. I was living in uh, Toronto at the time. I picked it up, I read it, and I thought, you know, now for the first time I really have some understanding of what psychoanalysis is all about. And the sensibility that they were moving towards was very consistent, consistent with the interpersonal sensibility, which I already had. So uh, essentially what was happening was that um, at least the relational aspect of psychoanalysis was moving towards a sensibility which was more consistent with the way in which I... And you found I material saw there which was really useful for you to, to bring into what you were doing. Exactly, exactly. Uh -huh. And so... Um, Without going into all the details for you know sort of a number of years, I would sort of incorporate certain ideas from contemporary relational theorists. I would read you know the, the journals and so on and so forth, and then ultimately I went into formal psychoanalytic training uh, in New York. Okay, so what if you I mean um, after all this, and, and, and uh, I know that sometimes you even write in your articles that. You don't even try to change it. Change is even a difficult uh, concept in a certain way, at least from a Buddhist perspective. I mean, what kind of change are you looking for in, in clients? Or are you looking for change? <laughs> It's a big question. <laughs> yeah. Um, But make it simple. Like, what, what comes to mind? Like, so what... what What kind of change do you like to see to happen to your... What makes you happy when you see? Yeah, you know, my, my sense is that, um, to, to some extent, the kinds of changes that I see depend upon the state of mind that I'm in and the people that I'm working with, you know. Um, I'm probably not somebody who has ever sort of, um, you know, some therapists, for example, in this you know, strategic therapy movement at a certain point of family systems movement or maybe the early cognitive behavioral movement would talk about these dramatic changes that can take place quickly. I mean, that, my life has not been one of making dramatic changes personally. You mm -hmm. know, any changes that I've made in my life have been subtle. What do you think is the most important change that you made in your life, even subtle? Um, yeah, I think just sort of the growing acceptance of things the way they are in some sense, you know? Not trying to change. <laughs> um, 
Perhaps, perhaps. I mean, did I ever struggle to change? Maybe there was a time when I had more of a desperate sense of not being happy the way I was and having some fantasy that one day I'd be different. Mm -hmm. And so I probably think that over time I've had sort of a growing acceptance of my own, you know, sort of vulnerabilities and humanity, I guess is what it comes to. And with that, it's become a little bit more patience for myself and patience uh, uh -huh. with other people. I really resonate with that when you say this because this is one of the things that I uh, noticed when I I, uh, I like this video with uh, with the woman uh, the, the relational video we've made with APA where the, with the woman who um, whose father has shot her husband mm -hmm. and I think it's so so she has this interpersonal style, and, and of course you can see that this somehow creates, or can create problems to her, but there's also this, it's more than acceptance, it's really like you admire, really admire her, how she finds her way out and her way to survive with this terrible drama that happens to her. I guess it touches somehow on Buddhism, but I mean, it, I find that really beautiful, this this very deep, not the only acceptance, but the admiration of human condition. Can you... Yeah, I mean, that sort of feels like almost, I don't know if it's a, a different dimension, maybe it's a related di dimension, but um, yeah, probably there is some sense in which I've developed a greater ability to appreciate you know, people for who they are and you know, in, in their sort of uniqueness, and also, uh, you know, I guess I, I, I do see, you know, sometimes I, you know, I'm just really sort of um, blown away by the sort of strengths that people mm -hmm. show, in a way, or, you know, or, or, or just sort of like the struggles that they've been through, etc. So, I think probably in that case, it's, it's not so much, I think the sort of acceptance has, has, has less to do for me with, like, it's not so much that I, for example, admire myself more, you know, if anything, if anything, I probably admire myself a lot <laughs> less than, than I do when I was younger, you know. Um, it's just the way in which I, I, I'm just, um, I'm not going to say I'm, you know, happy with who I am, but I'm just sort of somewhat more accepting, you know, uh, uh, with myself than I, than I was when I was younger. And I think that's probably true. There's a way in which, you know, I see that people you know, get very, very stuck, you know, and it's incredibly hard to change. And I think there probably was a time when that would be a source of... I think when I first started seeing that when I was doing therapy when I was younger, I thought, oh my God, I, you know, it's like I'm, I'm a failure. Um, in gradually over time, you know, I began to sort of have a sense of well, you know, sometimes people seem to change or they make some very quick changes, etc., etc., but, it, you know, it's sort of not as, as simple as, as, as that. And I just began to develop the sense that, look, it, sometimes people can be very, very stuck, you know, and the changes they make, um, you know, may be remarkably subtle um, over a long period of time. Time. Like there's somebody who I'm working with now where at some point I, I, I remember saying to him, and it's, it's, this is not a phrase that I, I use all the time with patients, but I, I, you know, I just said something like, um, you know, look, if you can maybe change, you know, 2% or 3%, you know, that's, that's enough. And, and he actually, what was interesting to me was that, you know, sometime later on, he hung on to that, and that was significant for him. But I think it's not just that I, I used those, those words. I think that was sort of like my using those words in that context with him was a way of sort of capturing a certain sensibility I had in the relationship with him that I wanted to convey to him, right? And that was that was meaningful to him, right? And I could I, I could see that. And I think that's been meaningful 
to me, I think I've always struggled, in a sense, with the question of, you know, what is change and how much can people really change? And I, I've asked various people the same question, you know, people who I admired, people who I thought were, um, you know, wonderful therapists. Um, there was this gestalt therapist who I worked with for a number of years who I learned a tremendous amount from. His name was Harvey Friedman. I hope he's still alive. And um, I remember at one point asking him, because he used to talk a lot about the experiences he had working with Fritz Perls and how he changed. And, and so I asked him, because he sometimes made it sound like change was very dramatic for him. And I asked him, well, so what, is, what does change mean? He says, look, he says, you can do things heavy or you can do things light. <laughs> and that just sort of struck me in some way. I'll, I'll give you another example. Um, I had a teacher for many years who was a Tibetan Lama. Uh, who was in his 60s at the time. And um, I used to ask him a lot of questions about, because the students used to say he was, quotes, enlightened, whatever that meant. And I would say, so what does it mean to be enlightened? You know, people say you're enlightened, you're enlightened. He said, I don't know. Um, and he said, look, and his English was not very good, but he was speaking broken English and say, Look, he said, I have emotions. I think he, he used to sort of like tease me because, you know, I was a psychologist and he heard I wrote about emotions or, you know, he said, I have emotions, I have, I'm sad, I'm angry, I'm this, I'm that, you know. Um, he said, but, you know, I have all the concerns that anybody else concerns. It's just that my concerns, the phrase he used was, just don't have the same kind of root that they used to have. Whatever, you know, whatever that, I'm not quite sure what he meant by that, but it was just, some other captured the same sensibility. And he was a very much, I was struck by the fact that he was very much of a vulnerable human being with a lot of flaws, who was still revered by his students because of his, of his kindness and his humanity and his compassion. There was something special about him, you know? So I think I've always struggled with that question of what, what is change and how much can you change? And I think that's, in some sense, that there's really a limit to change, maybe. You know, it's not like we're going to be super happy persons. At least maybe. that's the way I see the world. You know, yeah. mm -hmm. people see the world differently. You know, for some people, I remember at one point um, I was started this project with some students where we were interviewing some people about changes they'd had. You know, and we interviewed some people who said, you know, we talked about amazing, dramatic changes they've had. Or I know there's this book out that some people put out a number of years ago called Quantum Change. I can't remember who, who wrote it, but, you know, they were psychologists who, you know, sort of interviewed various people who talked about having profound experiences. And clearly people do have profound experiences, you know, where, you know, the difference seems like the difference between night and day. Did but, you ever have that? No, no. That has not been my experience. Uh -huh. okay. But people do have those experiences, I believe it. Sure. I, I would like to sidestep a little bit because this is related in, in, in a sense. You, you as a therapist, uh, quite easily admit helplessness and impotence in, in moments of being stuck and don't know how to help, really. And. Um, Actually, through your influence, I started doing that as well, and it's really a liberating experience for a therapist. But I also wonder, what, how do you think that is important for a client, for a patient, to know or to see their therapist admit that you know they're helpless or they're in, feel impotent at a certain point? Yeah. I think there's something, I mean, I, I, you know, you know, maybe at some point in my life I sort of, you know, sort of thought about how that might be useful for a client. Um, and I suppose, but it feels a bit far away because it's just become such a natural part of who I am. But I, I suppose there is some level that if I think about experiences that have been very important to me, it's... When you see somebody, I, I think there's this complex dynamic, okay, where if you um, go to see a therapist, 
you're automatically in the role of um, sort of being the sort of like dependent person Keep who's already, looking, yeah, 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 towards. I mean, it, you know, in, in psychoanalytic terms, it's, it's a transference, right? So, right. you know, inevitably, you you even if you're not aware of it, you know, and even if you sort of like you feel critical of the person, there's still some way that the role confers a certain mm-hmm. authority and power and as you the person admit these moments it's kind of demystified well it's not just that it demystifies you know if you see if if you're with somebody and it's somebody who you know is working with some integrity and who really wants to help you and you sort of feel has some degree of wisdom and has lived life Mm -hmm. and you see that you know there's a way in which they to some extent can accept the fact that they're human beings Mm -hmm. you know that helps you get a sense it helps me get a sense of that's all there is there's just being a human being it's like you don't become a superman or a superwoman it's like everybody has this transformative fantasy you know that you know one day you know I'll be psychologically healthy one day enlightened. I'll become enlightened one day I'll be and I think to the extent that you sort of like start to see that that that's not what it's all about I think that's very free mm-hmm. okay. next thing I would like to go to is as I read back through your books, um, I mean, I find a cer- I recognize a certain style in your videos, which in, in your vignettes, and of course there, there are many different interventions, but some are very typically and really uniquely for me. Oh, that's saffron, you know. I, I don't see that very much in other therapists, and I'm going to give you a couple of examples. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, so see if you can recognize it, and we can we can understand a little bit better what that is. So, for instance, in the interpersonal process book, you say you're too fast for me. It keeps me off balance in a way. Or when you say that, I start doubting my sanity. I said that. Yeah. <laughs> <coughs> exactly like that. That was basically what you said. Yes. In the negoti- negotiation book. So you say, uh, you say, so the ball is in my field now, or something like that. So my or in English, I feel yeah. uh, nailed to the wall, or I feel stuck right now, and I can't find the right thing to say. In the interpersonal APA video, you say, it feels uh, very nice to be cared for by you, but it also creates a sort of pressure or stress in the relationship. And in the sixth video series... You say, I feel put on the spot. I feel I have to cut the slack, I think is the, uh, the expression. I feel at a loss. And in the rupture video, uh, you say, I feel that there is nothing that I can say that will be helpful to you. When another point, you say, I feel pushed away or feel hit over the head. Mm-hmm. Now, mm-hmm. If you hear these, my selection, let's say, yeah. uh, well, what, I mean, what comes to mind? I mean, what, what kind of interventions are these? Mm. Well, the um, I mean, it's interesting because some of the things that you're reciting, I actually don't remember saying, although I believe you. Uh-huh. Um, but some of them sound more familiar. And I think that, you know, one of the issues is that, um, you know, sort of over time, you know, you know, especially like, you know, as I'm writing or teaching or, or whatever, you know, sort of like, I'll end up giving examples to people, so I'll use the same example more than once, right? But there's a way in which once I've said the same thing more than once, it's not real anymore. It's, it's a thing, mm-hmm. right? So, I, and, you know, any one of those things, um, you know, hopefully, if it, if it sort of felt right at the time, mm-hmm. it sort of captured some sense, some um, um, some implicit sense I had, intuitive sense I had of something that was going 
on at the time in the relationship that wasn't articulated, and I was also trying to capture it in a way which sort of um, sort of wasn't blaming the other person, you know, but rather was sort of mm -hmm. acknowledging, you know, sort of my 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 dilemma in some way, and you know, sometimes when I've said things of that sort, you know, there is, um, it does end up being blaming. It, it, it's not just, a, a, I mean, over time I've come to feel, at one point I used to think, well, you have to find a way of saying things that aren't blaming. It, it's not so, I don't feel that way anymore. It's more like when there's an impasse or when I'm feeling stuck and I start trying to talk to somebody about what's happening, there's a way in which, at the beginning, I'm still stuck, I'm still in, embedded, I'm still, you know, sort of participating unconsciously in what's going on. So often, the first time I try to say something, even though I think, you know, if you think of it, it's like if you're having a fight with your wife, okay? Mm -hmm. You know, it's like um, anything you say, you know, or anybody you're close to, it's just like, you think it's a way of getting out of the argument, but it's just another move in the same game, mm -hmm. you see. And, and, and so the, I think that's the sort of realization which has become very important to me, that like I think I'm doing something different, right? So when I'm saying these things to patients, I think I'm doing different. Sometimes I am, but sometimes it's just another move in the same game, uh -huh. right? And it's just sort of like gradually over time as I sort of like, Gauge the response and think about what I'm doing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, that things shift inside of me, and when things shift inside of me, I'm able to see things in a new way. And when I see things in a new way, then I'm able to communicate about what's going on in a way which is stepping outside of the dance. Mm -hmm. And when I'm able to do that, that's not blaming them. That's not blaming me. Yeah. You know, when I, when I was of course, there's the, the issue of form of how you say it and if it's blaming, if you feel it is critical and, and all that, and if you can really take distance. But when I read all those things, not all of them, but many of them, I thought, in, in a way, it, it seems like you're communicating to the person how you are uncomfortable with them. Like how people push and pull and, and control or give you the control or manipulate you subtly or distance to distance themselves or come too close and, and it's like you're I, I was trying to understand how you do it or what, what this is and it, it somehow struck me that it seemed like you're, you're communicating subtle discomfort that you feel in the interaction does that make any sense? It, it, it does and, and you know clearly when I you know talk about what's going on in that way or meta-communicate, um, I am responding to a feeling of being stuck or uncomfortable, okay? But I think there was a time when I used to think that what was important is that I'm sort of communicating the impact they're having upon me, hopefully in a non-critical way. The shift has been that I don't think that's what's most important anymore. I think what's most important is for me to begin a process of talking about things which will ultimately help me move into a different state of mind so I can see things differently. And when I see things differently, then I'm no longer feeling blaming of the other person. Or I'm no longer feeling it's like they're either, it's either their fault or my fault. So it's something you do together. Yeah, when I can genuinely see that, I'm, you know, I could give various examples, but when I can sort of like mm -hmm. genuinely see things in a new way, then the words come out in a way sure. which is helpful. Uh -huh. but there is a kind of uh, uncomfort before you start saying and expressing, or trying to express, like a, a marker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah, yeah, I, 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 I begin marker. to get a sense is that something mm -hmm. is is stuck or not quite right or yeah you know what, what I really I mean whenever you make these interventions I mean that 
they're really like, wow, yes, that's exactly it. I mean, I think that you're really very good at capturing and putting that into words. And it's, as you say, it's really like the not any word. It's it's like the word for that situation. It's very specific and new and fresh. And that that's exactly what's happening. So much, even that you, you had these videos, which are the rupture videos, mm -hmm. I think, that were uh, done with actors, and, and they somehow don't really fit. That's my, my yeah, sense. Of because course. it's not really of that course. person. So, yeah. And I wonder, I mean, this, this, this sensibility you have to, to, to notice what's going on for little discomfort or, you know, that it's not entirely straight, sort of, like mm -hmm. Kaiser says. I mean, did you always have this or is this, I mean, I guess it improved, but it, I mean, it's, it's there from the beginning, you know, that you... The se well, the sensibility that something is a little bit off was always there. I think gradually over time I began to sort of develop more of a sense of the value of articulating and putting it into words. But I think the important di distinction that I want to make, and this boils back to, uh, or this harkens back to a conversation you and I were having just before we started this interview, mm -hmm. is that as I see it, what I'm doing is not like a form of character analysis in the Reikian mm -hmm. sense, you know. Mm -hmm. Maybe at the beginning it was. It was influenced by that. It was influenced by my reading of Wilhelm Reich. It was influenced by training as a gestalt therapist, etc., etc. You know, there's some sense in which, like, if I could sort of, like, comment on the person's, you know, what they're doing, what their character is, etc., etc., that might be helpful. Um, I think that the shift has been to sort of a, a realization that the, the, for me, the most important aspect is not helping the person see what they're doing. I mean, they may ultimately come to see what they're doing, but the important shift is for me to be able to step outside of the enactment, shift the way I'm feeling, and when I'm able to do that, when I'm able to see things from a new perspective, and that helps the person begin to shift the way they see things. And so it's like working from the inside out rather than the outside in. You're really in the dance with the person. In some ways, yes, yeah. In some ways? Well, I, did, I mean, I did rather, yes. I, I want to elaborate in great detail. Yes, yes, okay. yes, yes. Definitely in the dance with the person, yes. <laughs> Unequivocally. This this uh, notion of dance, yeah, um, it's um, how do you listen for it? I mean, this touches a little mindfulness, but it's like you listen for something. It's not you. You're not going to listen to your to the noise of the. Uh, yeah, you know, street or something. I mean, there's a certain. I mean, it's a. I mean, I could answer that at different levels. You know, I mean, sort of one level in some ways. The easiest level is that, you know, if I begin to feel that something feels a little uncomfortable, or you know, sort of, if if I notice that there's some shift in terms of my feeling of relatedness to the person, you know or I start to notice some shift in my emotion, then I start to try to understand what's going on. So that's one level. But the, the other thing is, I think, over time what's happened is I've begun to sort of feel that it's almost like it, sort of every person, there's a certain, you know, it's like a certain kind of music to who they are. Mm -hmm. There's a certain kind of music to being in a relationship with them. Metaphor. You know, uh -huh. and so there's something about just sort of like feeling your way into that music and who you are in relationship with that person and, you do want and to that music. That. Hmm? And you do want to communicate that. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and there's something about that that sort of gives me a sense, sort of like an intuitive sense of like, what's the essence of that person, at least to me, and obviously the essence of that person is influenced by who I, you know, my take on it is influenced by me. But it's way of like feeling myself into the music of that person, 
you know, and who they are with me at least. And do you feel that all the time? Or is that something... Outside of therapy, you mean? Yes. Or or less aware of it outside of therapy. There's there's something, um, you know... Are you aware of it now? um, No, I'm not really... Let me put it this way. If if, if I felt um, uncomfortable with what was happening now, you know, right now, for example, I'm aware of the fact that we have somebody watching us who's probably feeling a little bit impatient right now, so I'm, I'm, I'm aware of that, okay? Uh-huh. Um, yeah, certainly at some level I sort of like watch you to get a sense of, you know, how you're responding to what I'm saying, okay? But, you know, by and large I'm sort of enjoying this conversation, the opportunity to sort of like articulate, you know, uh-huh. what, I, what I feel and think. Um, but there's a way in which unless I'm called upon by the situation, there's something about when I'm there as a therapist, you know, and I'll say this to people, there's something about the circumscribed situation in which I'm not there primarily to take care of, or I don't have to, I mean, obviously my needs are important, but basically I have a job. Mm -hmm. My job is to be as helpful as I can to the patient. Okay, now I have to take my needs into account to the extent that I don't, then I'm not going to be helpful to the patient. But there's something about the sort of the well defined focus of it that helps me focus and be more aware of things than I am in everyday life. So it's almost like an altered state of consciousness. If I could be like that all the time, you know, um, that would be great, but I can't. Mm-hmm. Is that where mindfulness comes in for you? Well, there's yeah, there's a way in which there's. I think there's something about doing therapy. Was doing therapy is one big mindfulness practice. You know, it's not like you have to do mindfulness mindfulness practice to be a therapist. It's like doing therapy for me. It's like it's the same thing as doing sort of like you know a sitting meditation. It's like an ongoing mindfulness practice. That's what it is. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it heightens your awareness. It's an altered state of consciousness. And that's actually, yeah, I mean, that's one of the, you know, best things about it. What's beauty in therapy for you? That. <laughs> <laughs> I, I knew you were going to ask me that question. I had other answers ready for you. Well, give me a few. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, but this is... I mean, that's, it, that's incredibly important. Though. I hadn't really sort of thought about it. It's, it's just like the heightened state of awareness I can develop uh-huh. when I'm doing therapy. You know, sort of related to that is, you know, sort of like some sense of... Um, How does it make you feel good? There's a, just a sense in which all of my senses are alert. Um, it makes me aware of, helps me become aware of what's most important in life to me. You know, it makes me think about my life, you know, and what's been important in my life, you know, what... You know, it makes me, when I'm working with people, I think about what I'm struggling with, what I have struggled with. You know, it's like, you know, sometimes there's like an incredible relationship between doing therapy and how I'm feeling in my everyday life. It's sometimes when I'm stuck in my everyday life, doing therapy with the patient helps unstick me, you know. Sometimes it's the other way around, you know. People pay you. Hmm? And people pay me. <laughs> Can you believe it? Yeah. <laughs> But the, 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 there is something about it. So, I mean, look, it's, I mean, you know, as a therapist, it's, you know, it can be hard work, it can be, it can be painful, it can, you know, be hurtful. People say all sorts of horrible things to you, you have failures, it can be boring, etc., etc. There's also a way in which at its, at, at its best it helps me live life in a way that feels right to me. Not just while I'm doing therapy, but it can sort of have an impact on my life outside of therapy. What was the other beauty? Or is that irrelevant next to this? Oh, I can't even remember anymore what I was going to say. <laughs> I mean, to, to be frank, you know, sort of the, the answers I was going to come up with don't feel as real to me as, as, as this right now. Yeah. It is beautiful, really. It's... Makes me jealous. <laughs> <laughs> no, it really can be. <laughs> Not always, obviously. You know, I mean, I don't want to, you know, sort of I, I really, I mean, that's the other thing. It's like, I don't want to, you know, sort of glamorize or idealize, mm-hmm. you know, my experience as a therapist, you know. It's like, uh, and, and this is important, I think. It's like, I, I think it's a way in which, 
Um, you know, I, I feel that you know, there's a way in which when I'm working with people, I sort of like, I sort of struggle between moments when you know when I sort of like have some sense faith that it's worthwhile and that it's viable and I can help them and some sense of despair, you know, about, you know, my ability to help them. And, but again, that coincides with my own life. There's some sense of if I'm feeling despairing about mm-hmm. therapy, then I'm feeling despairing about life. Or I'm, if I'm feeling despairing about life, then I'm feeling despairing about therapy. So it's that kind of struggle between faith and despair. We have to end, I guess, but my last question would be, could you just, when you, you were exactly going this direction of my question, it's, it's like, I mean, I mean, how does that work? I mean, you're with a patient and the patient's struggling and you're remembering all these things of your own life as well. Isn't it confusing? I mean, how, can you tell a little bit more about that? How, how does yeah, no, it's not, it's not confusing. Or? No, no, it, it, you know, I mean, there's time to do all of that. You know, I mean, it's, um, at least I find, you know, it's, it's not as if, you know, I sort of start thinking of my own life and then I get distracted, etc. Or if I do, it's not a big deal. It's just, look, our minds are complicated. A lot of things go on at once, you know, if, if you attend to them, you know. So somebody would be talking about something and all of a sudden I remember something that happened to me, you know, when I was 15 years old or, you know, I'll be thinking about something in the future. And, you know, at the same time, I'm listening to the person and... And, and, and so there's just it's resonances, you know? Resonant and resonating. And yeah, so that it all just kind of comes together, I, I feel. And so there's room for it all. And it, and it is that, um, I think it is those sort of resonances between the patient's life and my own life experiences and my thoughts about my patient, my thoughts about my life and life in general that create a whole uh, for me. Well, it came out really clear. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. I feel somehow that I'm so distant from that. <laughs> <laughs> really? Yeah. Well, I'm often distant from it myself. <laughs> you know, it's just, uh, it's, it's, it's like, look, you're interviewing me right now. Mm-hmm. You know, sort of rising to the moment of the interview helps me get in touch uh-huh. with, with what I feel passionate about. Mm-hmm. Right? Do I always feel like that in my life? No. Do I always feel like that when I'm doing therapy? No. Mm-hmm. But right now, in the context of this discussion, this uh-huh. interview, it's sort of I start to feel passionate. It's great. Yeah. It doesn't mean I always feel that way. It's something like therapy at its best for you. Like, it really works out. Yeah. It's like it's like life at its best. It's like relationships at their best. Mm-hmm. Moments of the best. I think this was a wonderful moment. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.